Welcome to another edition of the Sim Racing Garage. I'm Barry Rowland. In this episode, I'll be taking you on a journey to build a true 6DOF motion system. This from using existing motion technologies that you can buy today. Using the awesome JCL V4 motion system and the most excellent <laughs> Next Level Racing Traction Plus platform, I will be attempting to build a believable 6 Direction of Freedom or DOF motion experience. Now, I'll be showing you all the challenges that needed to be met to make this dream cockpit become a reality. So, let's get to it. So let's take a closer look at this 6DOF build. So first thing we'll do is go low <laughs> and we'll get down to this next level Traction Plus platform that everything is sitting on. And that's the base, of course. So yeah, that's taking all the weight, <laughs> which is about 500 pounds. Now, of course, I had to manufacture or fabricate some brackets that would let this happen. Now, the brackets that I have on here, I actually have a segment in this video that goes into great detail on what I came up with for mounting, but needless to say, it is working quite well. Now, with this bracket system, you are also able to statically mount a profile rig to the Next Level Racing Traction Plus system. I have it sitting on actuators because that's the way that I wanted to set this up, obviously, to get 6DOF. So, again, we'll go into detail on the, on the segment that you can look up in the description for this video and follow along. But as you can see, we've got the actuator sitting on some 4080 profile, and those four profiles are sitting on some adapter plates that I fabricated. We'll go to the back, and we'll go around here and just take a look at the bottom part, give you a better look at how that bracket is working. Now, when I first was going to do this bracket, I had some other ways of capturing the feet on these actuators. But I found a much better solution, and that's these cuffs that you see here. And they are made for 4080 profile, and they work a treat. And they are from PT Actuator. Now, I did have to put some material in there to make this cup a captive cup instead of a non-captive cup, which would allow it to slide around a little bit. It, either way would probably work, but I just went with that. Right, so we're moving around again on the bottom here. And of course, we can see the same thing going on up here. Plenty of clearance for the JCL V4 frame sitting on here. And we'll go ahead and go around to the get a better look at this. So sitting on the frame is what we've already seen before in a review that I've done, which is the excellent JCL Racing V4 platform with Surge. And you'll notice that there is a P1X cockpit sitting on top of this V4 chassis. And I also have a segment in this video of how I went about making this narrow enough to accept the P1X chassis. P1X chassis is 580 millimeters wide. The original chassis or the stock or default chassis that JCL has for their V4 is a 780 millimeter chassis. And that's what usually ships. But again, they can make this as we see. And this is again a proof of concept that they can make it any width that you want to fit on here. Even the harness tower that is an important part of, by the way, the surge system on the V4 chassis fits in there just fine at 580 millimeters. And yeah, what can you say about this chassis, the V4? It's just a, a, a very, very nicely sorted unit. And the surge is just something that you have to try for yourself to understand how just how good it is. And you can see the P1 is just sitting in those slider brackets that are sliding on linear bearings and rails. So everything moves quite well. And again, I have a detailed segment on how this all went together as far as setting the <laughs> P1X cockpit down inside of this. Once I had shortened the cross members of the original JCL V4 chassis that was sent to me for testing. Right. Now, you also notice that I have some a brake configuration here for the brake tray, uh, brake pedal tray rather, that is different than the stock one. Of course, the P1X comes with that nice height adjustable pedal tray. 
But because I was able to fit this onto the P1 and chassis, or P1X, P1, same thing, as far as width goes, I was able to fit this with that linear rail system on there that makes it so easy to adjust the pedals and really locks it down very, very tightly once you set it back down. And the reason I did that was because I do have, as you might imagine, a few people coming by from time to time to try these cockpits and try the movement in them or lack thereof, but this makes it a lot easier to adjust things, especially when my seat is kind of fixed on four bolts, but I can loosen those bolts and slide the seat forward and backward pretty easily. And we don't have the original V4 steering wheel mount here, so we don't have that sliding accessory or that sliding motion that we can get out of it. Right, so we have the Prisma seat from NRG mounted, and we have a Schroth six-point harness system, and everything is working quite well. So, yeah, just wanted to give you guys a shot of this. We, I did put a floorboard in there. I cut down the original floorboard so it would fit this 500 millimeter gap in here so that when people get in and out, they're not stepping on the controller boxes. Great idea, right? And we have the Bodner 54G Sim Steering 2 mounted up here to the great front mount that comes with your P1X or the former P1 cockpit from Sim Labs. And we're running the Wave Italy pedal pack here. And that's about it. I don't have a shifter mounted right now. And it's just a simple matter of coming over here because I am in a right hand shifting country <laughs> and just mount my shifter like I would on the P1 that you guys have seen in many videos when I was testing shifters out. So I just don't have it mounted right now because the people were in here testing. I had over, really, really didn't need to do any shifting. We just did all the shifting on the paddle shifters because we were really just testing out the motion. So everything works a treat. Yeah, everything went together well. There was a lot of work in it, as you might imagine, pulling the V4 chassis completely apart to get the cross members out. And this is the front one you can see here and that had to be trimmed 200 millimeters. So yeah, that was four of those I had to do. And then of course reassemble and put it, like I said, it was kind of a labor intensive thing to do all that, but the results I think are more than worth it. And again, you can check down in the description for the segments for those pieces of this video as far as how I mounted a P1 to the V4 and also how we did the bracket fabrication for our next level Traction Plus platform. So right, the next thing we're going to do is get into the platform, go ahead and fire it up. And I might even show you guys a little shot of it moving as we get everything fired up and ready to go. And then we'll get in and take a look at the GUI or the controller software for both the D-Box and the Next Level Racing. And yeah, this is something that could have been a problem having two dissimilar systems coming together and trying to get them to work together and sync up properly so you get something that felt like a real car is not something that's guaranteed when you do a project like this. So we'll take a look at what I ended up with in those configurations. So we're going to take a quick look at the startup sequence of this system. And they start at different times. The Next Level Racing's Traction Plus will start first, and then the D-Box system on the JCL V4 chassis will start. And I have everything wired into this power strip over here so I can turn it on. And I'll come over here and we'll turn on the next level racing. Watch it move. All right. And now we'll see the D box system should come up. And there we go. And now we're ready. So everything is online. Everything went through their boot up process and self calibration process. And now we should be good to go. So let's go take a look at the settings we ended up with for this 60OF platform. Now let's take a quick look at the configuration I ended up with. And I'm, this is still uh, kind of a work in progress. I tweak it a little bit here and there, uh, depending on what I want to do as far as dirt or regular circuit driving, that kind of thing. So up here, I have the iRacing motion code settings window open. And of course, we get that open from down here in settings in the D-Box Game Center. And I have this on 50. We'll go to the actual editor and 
what I've done here is the accelerations for left and right, as far as roll is concerned, I actually have turned that down a lot. And the reason is when you have this sway platform that's doing the sway and the yaw, this traction plus platform from next level racing, you don't need much roll because it, you know, there, you still want a little roll obviously, but you just don't need much because now you have something else that really kind of takes precedence over that when you feel it. So you don't need as much roll. So I'm trying to, to minimize my movement to, to where I need it in, in, or where I don't need it rather and give myself movement where I do need it. So again, we've turned that down to 29 versus the up and down. I still want to feel the road bumps and that's at 47. So we go down here, the surge gain, I've got 54 and surge reactivity, I have 43. And the rest of the stuff is just the normal effects, engine vibration, skid vibration, suspension, surface texture, things like that. Now, I'm going to go over to the Next Level Racing configurator or their configuration software. And you see I have some iRacing uh, profile saved here. And I'm going to go ahead and click on that. And I noticed that it would not, it, or it didn't by default, this next level Traction Plus platform did not enable itself when the game started. It may have been because I had D-Box running already and D-Box saw the game and it started, but I found it was very easy to just go in and pull whichever profile it's working on and just click on activate. And once you do that, it, it goes back down, then I'll pull it back up. And then I can go to my oversteer and understeer. And this is where I wanted you guys to actually have a look at what's going on here. Now, when I first got the profile, now this is the newer profile for iRacing. Remember when I did the review for the Traction Plus, I only had a profile for a set of Corsa at that time. Now, of course, we have the iRacing profile. And I noticed when I was first testing it that it was a little bit, well, it was actually a lot, yaw prone or yaw biased. In other words, I go around a turn and it would yaw instead of the front moving, it's, it moved a little bit, but the rear moved a lot more. And at first I thought it might be pivot point, that didn't do anything. Then I went under to vehicle understeer proneness. So this is what worked. I think at default it was like way down here. I, I forget it was very low. I have it 42 now. Let's see as low as I can go. Yeah, it was right there at five. So I actually have it up to 42, five something or 05. In, anywhere in there is fine. And yeah, that's, that's what I ended up with. But if you'll also notice here on the other effects, understeer effect intensity, I have that at 81. This stuff all defaults to like 1.25, including the oversteer effect intensity was 125, and so was everything else. So I've got that, as you can see, cranked down a bit. And that is because it's, it was just too much, at least in my opinion. Of course, all of this is subjective. Again, the, the, the standard disclaimer from the SRG yeah, it's all subjective when it comes to motion, direct drive force feedback, all that kind of stuff. So whatever makes you happy is what you want to use. But this seemed to be a good setting with this understeer proneness for the other people that I had driving. And we'll see that when I get to the driving segment for this platform that, yeah, we've had a few other people in here. And yeah, as you might imagine, everyone was pretty happy. And we can adjust this on the fly. So I was making some adjustments as people were driving just to see what they thought was better. And everybody was pretty pleased what, what you see right here. Right, so there it is. Not much else to see here. Go back and it takes me back to this, this actual page. And let's get my settings back up for D-Box. And let's see, there it is. So I have usually have this window open and I'll have this one over here open when I'm doing my driving so that I can and always hit activate for some reason. Now I have it as a habit. <laughs> And yeah, so this is, this is the two screens I'll have open so I can actually tweak things back and forth and see how they feel. And I'm going by feel and by the video. I used to, sh I was shooting video when I initially started tuning this because I really, you know, I was trying to drive at the same time as feel, feel everything, but I also wanted to look over and see what the chassis was doing and, you know, how much it was moving and how much, you know, it took to, or, or how little it took for me to feel the effect the way I wanted to. So that was, that was fun doing that. So anyway, this is what I've ended up with. Of course, again, subjective, but now let's just get in here and I'm gonna drive, you'll see me driving in, in a couple of different angles on the camera, then I'll show some other guys driving 
And those guys obviously had a great time, but they also were different weights. And another thing I always wanted to talk about, and I'll talk about that while driving. Remember, we have an official claimed weight limit of the Traction Plus platform from Next Level Racing to be 518 pounds. So I'm at 500 pounds with me in this rig as it sits. I had someone else that was about the same weight as me get in it and run it. I had someone that was 175 pounds and I had another person that was 185 pounds. So it was good to see the differences, if there were any, as far as how the system reacted to those added weights. And you, I think you'll see in the videos, there really wasn't any difference. Anyway, well, we'll see that when we get to the actual driving segment where we'll discuss all that next. So I've already narrowed the JCL V4 chassis. And yeah, it was a matter of, and I got a piece here, cutting down these four spreaders or crossing pro profiles to or by 200 millimeters. This was actually the, you can see the frame over there for the cockpit that was sitting on top of it before. Now that was 780 millimeters wide. So the P1 cockpit that I'm putting on here is 580 millimeters wide. So I only had to cut out 200 millimeters, right? So we got that done. Then we had to obviously put everything back together and we did a little bit of different cable management, not that much. What they had already pretty much was, was good to go, but I just had to rearrange a few things a little bit. And yeah, so everything went back together quite well. I've already tested it and it's looking good. So now all we have to do, oh, one more thing. This box back here, there is a concern of the surge actuator actually hitting the box when we had two of them sitting back here before. I had two on the other side of or this side of that bar. I had to move the bar back a little bit over here and move the second one over the bar to clear the reach of that actuator. Not a big deal, just sliding around a few things. Just again, just rearranging things a bit to make this work like it should. And there's are the brackets, the slider brackets that we'll be setting the cockpit into. And yeah, everything's ready to go. We're at 580 millimeters exactly on these brackets. So it should just fit right in there. And again, yeah, this is uh, something obviously you wouldn't be doing if you originally ordered the JCL V4 chassis or platform with the requirements for a P1 or, an, you know, for whatever requirements you have, either 580, 500, whatever the width of your profile cockpit would be. So yeah, all we've got to do now is set the... I'm putting a P1X on here and it's kind of stripped down so it's going to be lighter when we set it on this chassis and then I'll build it back up. But yeah, next we'll just go ahead and see if we can lift this on and make sure it fits right. Now we have the P1X bottom frame mounted to the JCL V4 frame. And we'll just kind of walk around here to see what we've got. And of course, it's sitting in the cradles in the position it needs to be sitting and it fit right in i'll show you a quick shot of it here it did uh, it's a snug fit which it should be because the v2 cockpit that was on top of it before was a very snug fit when i set it when i took it off and put it back on a couple of times when i was doing some things anyway so yeah it's looking good you can see that i have down here the surge actuator has plenty of room here i'm actually going to back this up a little bit the frame whoops <laughs> okay like that and then we're going to put the brackets on obviously so we can attach it on either side to this 4160 profile and everything's lining up perfectly so this is going to work i do have a little bit more on the back of this bracket hanging off the back of the bracket than i do on the front up here but i really don't think it's going to make a difference once this is bolted down yeah it's just going to be moving yeah pretty well and i've actually slid it around a little bit and you can see that yeah I'm just moving it with one hand here very easy to move I really love this this system man it's just so slick so this actuator right here won't have any problems moving this even when I get everything built on top of this with the seat the uprights wheel bases and pedals and all that kind of stuff so yeah we're looking really good at this point and yeah we'll just get on to the next segment I wanted to show you guys the P1X chassis securely mounted to the JCL V4 D-Box surge chassis. And yeah, it was a simple thing. 
just putting in some T-nuts and setting it into these brackets here, or sometimes I'm calling them cradles on the linear bearing system. And of course we have them in the back. No dramas putting this on because there are slots in these brackets. You can see the slots there. So it allows up and down movement of the screw in that bracket. So yeah, no dramas there. Everything worked quite well. Now I'm going to come over here and take a look at this beautiful surge actuator. And the brackets for this, again, no drama here. Everything went in quite well. And these holes lined right up with this 4160 series spreader or width plate or width profile, if you will. And over here on this side, you can see we have the brackets attached there. And yeah, everything's working good. In fact, I'm going to let's cruise over here and check these side brackets out. Again, no dramas here. And you saw before how it kind of just kind of fell in. It's a very snug fit. So our measurements were really precise when we got this cut. So that worked out a lot better than I had hoped. All right, so I'm going to fire this thing up and let you see the actuator working here in the back. So, but it takes a minute for this thing to boot up so we can see that. But we're going to watch that actuator work and see them moving the whole chassis. Yeah, that is beautiful, man. Just as slick as can be. And we've got a couple of bars here. These are 10 series bars. I've got some corner brackets. I'm going to cinch those down nice and tight. Once I get the floor plate cut so it'll fit in this 500 millimeter spacing. And I decided to, because I had it on hand, use the JCL's really cool linear bearing system for the pedal tray because it's going to make it very easy to adjust when people are coming by to try this out. And there will be a lot of people coming by to try this out, I can guarantee you. Anyway, we've got the wheelbases mounted. We got the seat over here getting ready to go on. So it's coming along quite well. And yeah, when we come back, we'll probably have the seat mounted, maybe the wheelbase in and some pedals. And yeah, see where we're at from there. In this segment, we're going to be talking about fabricating a bracket that's going to perform the duties that this bracket did when we had the GT track cockpit mounted to the next level Traction Plus platform. And all I really need this for is these holes here. It's going to be my template, if you will, to transfer this whole pattern onto this aluminum plate. Because I'm going to use this to create or fabricate, as I said before, the mounting system to put my P1 chassis on with the D-Box actuators. Or it may be another chassis with D-Box actuators. Haven't, haven't determined that yet, but we'll, when we get there, we'll take a look at that. So here's the idea. I need to transfer the pattern obviously on here so I can mount this plate onto the motion bars that you see here. And I'm going to use this 4080, not this particular one, but this 4080 profile. This is a 40 series 4080. And what I'm going to do with this is set it on top of those bolts. Once we have our holes, we can bolt this on. And then I'm going to set this on top of those bolts. Now, I'm not going to really set them on top of those bolts. What I'm going to do is drill some clearance holes that match the same pattern here so that the bolts will not interfere with this laying flat on the plate. All right? With me so far? <laughs> and then I'm going to take, I haven't determined how many I want to use yet, but I'm going to take some angle brackets. And you can see I can put one on each side when this is centered. Something like that. And I'm not sure how many I'm going to use. I might just use three on each side, depending how long it's going to be. But then I'll have this set up. So we're capturing the profile using this, these brackets here to the plate that's already mounted to the motion bar. At least I'm calling it a motion bar. And once that's achieved, this will be long enough to go out and capture the actuators on whatever platform that you're putting on this. I and mean, it could be anything, right? So we need to capture the feet though. And this is an example of a D-Box foot for, I call it a cup, for the 4400 actuators that I have. Now, I don't wanna just set the actuators on top and try to capture the foot without this little cup, right? So the idea here is, and this should work fine, is, let's see the best way for you guys to see this. Let me take these off. 
get it off this aluminum plate, is to capture this cup, which we can actually set the feed into. So we put the cup up here. If you'll see, the cup actually is about the same size. It just a smidge over the edges. And I want to take these corner brackets, some more corner brackets, obviously, and set these in here like this in the channels. And we're going to use these tabbed gusseted corner brackets, very strong. And being with tabs, they'll line up nice and strong in the profile here. And we'll do the same thing on the other side. This one doesn't have tabs, so we'll just set that one there, like this. So this will capture the foot so that it can't move this way, all right? So if it's on sitting on the motion simulator, that would be in a lateral direction. And not only that, but we can tweak the location laterally of the foot. Now remember, we have to get this pretty much perfect for the spacing. It has to be 1160 millimeters between the centers, where these holes are, of those motion bars. They have to, the centers of those bars have to be exactly 1160 millimeters apart or it won't function at optimum levels because that's how the software is calibrated. Those have to be that distance. So we have to work within those parameters. Now, what about going forward or backwards? Let's say we have a lot of pitch in our, our rig and we're worried about it sliding forward. Well, we can take another one of these and put it up here. And I've actually mocked it up. And we can actually, because of the slots in these, I can put a bolt in here, all right? And the bolt has a lot of room to move up and down. So I can actually put a T-nut in here with the bolt in it and still get this high enough to capture the edge of that foot. So now I have it boxed in here. And of course, I'll have one on the other side, boxing in on the other side. So now we've got full capture of this cup so it can't move. That's what I have for a mock-up. I'm, I'm thinking about two other solutions. This is one I'll use if, if the other two don't work. And one of them actually is, is the best solution of all if it is large enough to capture the bottom of the D-Box actuator, which I think it will be. And that is a prefabbed unit that another company makes that fits into the 40 series channel. And it's got a flange on either side of it and the cup is, is in the middle of it and it's all one piece. And that would be optimal. Yeah, that's what I am. I'm really looking forward to getting those. I ordered a set of those. I'm really looking forward to getting those so that, yeah, I can figure it out whether or not the D-Box actuators will fit in there. And if they do, great. If not, then we've got other things that we can do to still make it work to where this foot won't get away from us when we're moving around on the cockpit. So that's the idea. And drilling some holes on just one side of this profile, I'm not too concerned about it compromising the structural integrity of it as far as when we're going to load it on the uh, each side of this depending on how long it is i don't know how long it's going to be yet because we have we have to get there before we can determine that but i'm not too worried about just having some holes big enough to clear where's my little here it is this eight millimeter socket head cap bolt right so once i have a hole big enough to clear that in the same pattern it's just going to sit right on top and not cause any, any issues, I don't think, as far as any kind of a flex problem. And this should be pretty good. This is the, they call this actually a light profile, 40 series profile, because it's not filled in on these ends over here. And it's also a little bit less thick on the actual pieces that appear than a heavy piece. And it still should work because we got solid aluminum bar all the way through this profile. You can see it's solid right there and right there. So of course that runs or spans the whole length of whatever size of profile that we have. So I'm not too worried. I think this is gonna, as long as I don't have to put it out, you know, like six feet, <laughs> I'm not too concerned about it bending. And this aluminum plate over here is a 6061 plate and it's 6.6 .6 millimeters thick or a quarter inch thick. And that should be fine. The only thing we're gonna have to be concerned with is when we're mounting the plate to the module or the motion bars over there. I have to make sure that once I bottom out on top of this plate, I've got plenty of room, let's do it this way, for the screw to get enough of this screw or thread into that motion bar. Now this is a 20 millimeter socket head cap screw or bolt. And 
I'm thinking I might end up going with a 25 because I've always I've already run this in here and I'm just I'd like to have another five mil or so in that threaded piece in the motion bar. And I, I think that's what we'll end up with. But anyway, so what we'll do next in the next segment is actually get this aluminum plate measured out. We want to get the centers on it from we want to get the center from here to here. Make sure we're absolutely center. And we also want to get the center from the other edges here to here. And then once I know my dead center, then it's easy enough to come in with our bracket, set it on top of that center line. And also I'll make sure that I'm equal distance from each edge of this plate over here. And yeah, once we set it on there, then it's a matter of transferring these holes. And I'll show you how I do that over to the aluminum plate. And then we can drill it. And we should be done if we did all of our measuring correctly. So we'll tackle that when we come to the next segment. So I already have the centers marked out, or the center of this plate. And kind of bright lights in here, but I'll try to get a side. There we go. You can see the pencil marks that I put on there and where they cross is dead center on this plate. Now this is a very squarely cut plate. And I got this off eBay off a company I usually use because they have a good saw. And yeah, everything I get from them is pretty much perfectly square. But if it's not, that can throw you off a little bit and then you have to square it yourself. So it, it does raise some other issues, but no, no problem here. Now let's, to get the center and the reason I'm getting the center, I have to know exactly where the center is on this plate, as I discussed in the last segment to make all this work. And I want to be as precise as possible on the holes that I'm about to drill in this plate because it has to match that pattern perfectly. I will have a little bit of wiggle room around that hole because I'm going to make the hole. Obviously the hole's got to be a little bit bigger than the size of this thread, which is M8, which should be eight millimeter. Let's see what it comes up as. Let me flip it around so you guys can see it. So this is an M8 bolt and you can see it's actually 7.87 millimeters, eight, eight, eight. All right. So if I actually put a true eight millimeter hole in this plate, this is going to fit fine and actually have a little bit of wiggle room there. And I'd like to have it a little bigger though. So I'm probably going to go another few tenths of a millimeter over the eight, but we'll see once we get there. Right. But these holes have to be precise. And of course they have to match the pattern that is in this bracket over here. So that's why you want to start with a good center. So, you know, and I want the bolts obviously to be centered across here. So when I mount my profile on here, it will be centered also. Okay. So there's a couple ways to do this. Just measure the length or the width with a, a machinist ruler like this, and then divide by two, and that should give you your center. And then you can mark it on both sides of the plate like I did here. And <laughs> it's hard for you guys to see this. And then draw your lines again using the, your rulers down there. Or you can use one of these, and these are fun to use. <laughs> they do let's just cut the time down a little bit, do calculations. And you can see this has a zero over here in the middle with ones, twos, threes, fours, so forth, going out towards the left and right. And this is in inches, by the way, it's not millimeters. And all you do is you set this on the piece of metal and you look at the, the numbers on the end. And this is, I'm looking at tens that are close to being even. So I'll go to the tens and I'll look down on the sixteenths of an inch. It looks like what I'm going to have to use here. Let's see, I'll put this on a sixteenth of an inch short of the 10. And this one is actually a 32 over here. So that's a little bit off. If I move it back a little, wow. So I'm going to put the 32s, use the 32s. And if I look at it, now that I've done that, I can see that my center line here is perfectly on that zero line, which gives me confidence that I actually did it right. <laughs> and I just use the smaller one here. This is just another example of the same kind of thing. And yeah, and this is actually a, a precision machinist ruler. We actually have it in for those of you who care, in 30 seconds and 16 on this side, and then we flip it over, we can actually go to, we have 30 seconds, I can see this, 30 seconds of an inch here, and on the other side we have 60 fourths. Let me flip it around. So these are very, very fine marks you can see on the bottom of that rule, and that, and that you know, machinist rule, that's the way they're done. Sometimes I got to put the magnifier on to see those little marks to make sure I'm, I'm where I need to be. Anyway, so now that we've got this centered out, I know exactly where my holes are going to be. Everything's looking good. Then I go over to my bracket and I do the exact same thing. I actually found the center on this bracket. 
and I made him a little mark here. See that mark there? And you can see that mark is kind of in line here. Don't pay attention to this. This is some kind of a wear mark or something, but is right on center with the hole there. All right, the bottom of the hole. And I actually made a mark in the bottom of that hole. I don't know how well you're going to be able to see it, but it's right on the edge here. So th that the center of this plate goes right through the center of this hole too. So all I have to do is take the template, if you will, and I'm going to lay it on top of this aluminum plate. And what I'm looking for is to get my center mark marked up with my center line here. And that's looking pretty good. Now, once I've established that, then I have to look down. You guys are not going to be able to see this, unfortunately. But what I'm doing is looking down on right on top of these holes here and looking for that long centered line on the aluminum plate. Easy enough to see, really. Not that hard. And then I have to line all six holes up so that they intersect the holes here right through them in the middle. And it's easy to see that, actually, when you're looking that straight down on it. You can see when it's all lined up and ready to go. Okay, now I'm going to use a transfer punch. That's what this thing is. You can see you can get these things in a lot of different sizes. You can get a whole kit here that has a ton of them in it. And this is not metric. This is metric. So you're going to have to find, you're probably going to find that it's not exactly a super tight fit when you put it in there. In fact, I'll pull this off and show you. It is a pretty good fit though. This goes through like this and it's a pretty good fit. I mean, I can actually move it a little bit. See, that's the limit there. And that's the limit on the other side. So that's pretty close fit. And that's going to also allow me to pull this out very gently without disturbing the plate once I start my marking process. And you'll see the advantage of that as we do it. And yeah, it's, it's loose enough. And the next, the next size up on that kit is not going to fit in here anyway. Right? But this is actually, I like the way this is doing. It's just got a little bit of movement either way. So we're going to put the plate back on, line it right back up. Again, this is pretty easy to do once you've done this a few times. You know what you're looking for. Just getting everybody lined up, looking at all the holes, and that is looking brilliant. Yes. Now, also because this is a little bit loose, it won't be binding up on these holes when I'm trying to pull it back out. And it's got a short tip on this. Let me show you that right there so when it hits the surface of that aluminum it's it's short enough to where we're engaging the circle part here the bar part in that hole so it's not slipping around on me that's another thing if this plate was this bracket plate was any thinner then this would be so tall i couldn't i would be not getting any of this round part in the hole to hold it still so i'm kind of lost at that point i had to figure something else out but here we don't have any issues. And again, I always look at this three or four times just to make sure before I start the process. Now it's a pretty simple process. All I'm gonna do, all I need is a mark. I don't need to whack this thing, all right? I just need to, to get a mark. And that's what I'm gonna do. Hold it as straight as I can look down on it and try to get it as straight as I think it, it needs to be and just give it a little like that. I'll pull it up and look and that's a good mark. I can actually see that. And of course, we're just gonna work our way down very carefully because we don't want to disturb these plates while we're doing this. And that's all you have to do. See how easy this is? Beautiful. And all these marks are going right on that line that I have in there. And that's another indication that you've centered your holes properly on your line that's going all the way across this plate. Beautiful. One more. I'm getting nervous. I'm getting the last one here. Everything's going too well. <laughs> all right, there we go. All right, so that was successful. We didn't disturb the plates, so they stayed where they were, and now we have our marks, and that's all I need is a mark. I don't need a big dent or anything at this point. Now, I don't know how well this is going to show up. I'm going to try to show it to you. Eh. Okay, so we got a mark. Let's see if I can see them. There they are. One, two, one, two, there we are. I got a mark here. Get the light to shine on it. Uh, yeah, there it is. See it right there? And if I keep doing that, there's the second one next to it. And if I keep doing it, you'll see another one come up. There it is, close to the center that I made. And if we keep going, there's the other one. Now, those two are further apart from each other. And if we keep going, we should be able to see two more. And there they are, right on the line. Beautiful. 
Okay, so now we have to make these holes a little bigger. So what we'll do now is pull out my, what's known as a, they call this a prick punch. See that there? It's a prick punch. And the reason they call it a prick punch is because, well, it will give you a definite prick on your finger. It's very, very sharp on the ends of these. And this is when we have to make a very precise little mark. And not only that, because I just have barely a mark in this, this metal here, I need something very sharp that will fall into that like that. Now it's, it's sitting in the divot I already made. Now I can come in and start getting a little more aggressive with my marks. Just like that. And just work your way down. And it's just a wonderful thing when, when it all starts working like you want it to. And you know what? This I know this looks pretty tedious. But in the end, once we have perfectly aligned holes, you'll understand why we did it. The first time you don't have perfectly aligned holes, you'll understand why I'm doing this. <laughs> nothing's worse than nothing's worse than getting your holes all drilled out and then putting it where you need to attach it, and one of them is just a little bit off, and then it's just a mess. You have to start filing things and trying to get everything lined up. So just as a quick look there, you can see I've actually opened these holes up a bit. Start down there with these two. Where are they? There they are. So now we can actually see them a lot better. And I will continue this process until I get it where I want. Now I'll actually pull out my, if this is big enough, that's created a divot big enough for me to locate this one in. And this is my spring one. And I'll just go like this. And that really puts a hole in something or a divot. Makes a bit of a noise, but I'll just show you that real quick. Because you don't have to see me do all of these. See how much bigger it's getting compared to where it was before? Here's the, the closest center. There's the other one, but here's these two. And yeah, I'm going to go ahead, finish this up. Because once I finish setting these up, it's over to the drill press. And then we're going to start drilling our holes. Here are the plates with the holes drilled in to match the template that we marked before when we did our layout. And I just want to go over something real quick with you here. Now remember, this is an M8 bolt we have to use here. It has a cap head on it, right? Now this cap head has a bit of a lip on it there. It's about three, four millimeters wide. And I wanted this to fit into the hole. Obviously it has to go through the holes, but I didn't want it real loose because I just wanted to use the cap head edge here that you see here. I wanted to use that to contact the aluminum and pull the aluminum plate tight on that motion bar when we, when we bolt these down. Now, if the hole's too big, you can always use a washer, right? But even the washer will pull down a little bit trying to support the lip here. So it's better if you have a nice snug fit. I'll show you that here in the hole that you're using to bolt this down to. So I'll just put that in there. You see it drops right in. And the hole, and this head's going to have a lot of support there that way. We do have some wiggle in it, but not much. And you want a little bit of, la of lash in here, as we call it. You know, a little bit of room to move because we still have to have a little bit of play in here when we try to line this plate up to that bar over there. And hopefully, <laughs> if we did our, our part, then this should fit without a problem. Now, drilling the plate, no big deal. Uh, remember, this is an M8. I mic'd this out to, I think it was 8 just under 8.8. Eight. Let's see what we got here. Okay, yeah, it's uh, 7.8.6. And I used a drill bit that is 8.06. All right, so that's two tenths more than the bolt itself of a millimeter. So that's why it's such a nice snug fit, but still loose enough so we can play with it. Now, I also used, I like to drill pilot holes for this kind of precision drilling and that's 4.3 millimeter for this so i use this 4.3 millimeter drill bit to do my and i'll show you a shot of it here of actually drilling the holes first with the four millimeter and that removes material and also gives me a nice straight centered hole then we go back and we go with the 8.06 millimeter bit to follow that hole that we just did with the 4.3 
And when you're trying to make holes run true, even on a drill press, even though this is not a very good drill press, it's just a bench top. It's, it's nothing special, believe me. It's like a hundred dollars or something, something cheap, but it works. And yeah, so we got the holes drilled. Now all we have to do is go over and see how we did as far as matching the bar over here. So let's walk over here. And let's get this plate. See if it'll stick on here. First, I'm gonna start with the top hole and line that up. Go ahead and get that started. Oh, and by the way, I am using, as I said before, I might need a 25 mil, and that's what I'm using here, 25 mil length. All right, so I got the top one started. That's always easy, right? Now, we gotta get the bottom one started here. So I'm just gonna kinda put that in there, and there we go. But of course, this is a pattern we were following, so there's no guarantee the rest of them are gonna fit either. So we'll just start wiggling things around here and see if we can get these things started. Well, there's two. Yeah, we're going for four. That's three, rather. Four. There we go. Man, this is... How about this? One more. Done. Wow. That is great. So, yeah. We took our time, and yeah, that's all we got to do is take your time, get your layout right, and look at that. That is beautiful, man. And it doesn't get much better than that. Right, I would call that a good result. So, now that we have the plate done, all we have to do now is obviously get it figured out to where how long that profile is going to be that fits on top of this. Plus, I'm going to take these plates back over to the bench and mark holes for the corner brackets that are going to hold that profile. So, that'll be the next thing we do. And then I have to get the rig set up right so I'm ready to set the feet down on top of these bars, measure how wide that is where my feet are actually going to fall on those actuator feet, and then I have to cut the profiles to that length. We'll talk about that as we progress. But yeah, I call this a good result. Now let's look at mounting the profile piece to our plate here. And it's really simple. I mean, the hardest part was getting this pattern correct, so where it, as we saw, that it bolts directly to those motion bars. Now I went ahead and mocked up again this piece of 4080 that we're using, and went ahead and put my corner brackets on here, and I'm thinking that three corner brackets is going to be sufficient to hold this bar still once we have all the things bolted, because remember, we're going to be running M8 bolts through each one of these and have a nylon lock nut on the bottom of it. And in this, the nuts will clear. I already checked the clearance. So remember, our motion bars is actually a little thinner than this 4080 profile. So it's, it's not going to be a clearance issue for having bolts hanging down underneath it as it moves around. And yeah, I'm thinking this is going to be plenty once this is all securely bolted up. And I've went ahead and spaced out everything as far as the corner brackets. And this, again, is where the center on this plate comes into play, where our center mark is, which is the crossing one here, right? So I'm going to use these marks here when I put my profile on. I've already done that. First, you make sure your equal distances oops, <laughs> from the edges of this plate. So that should put me at center on the bar, right? So once the bar is centered, then it's a ma simple matter of sliding these center pieces in so I can see that line right through the groove here. And then I can start to make my marks. And I just move these brackets out to I have them three millimeters from the edge on both sides here. So they're equal too. And I'm, the reason I'm being so careful here, and some people would say anal, <laughs> is because I want to make sure that everything is centered for the load bearing that this bar is going to have to take on those two actuator feet on each one of these bars. Now remember, if the, if the cockpit, I'm, my guess, my, not my guessing, but my calculated weight is around just under 500 pounds with me in the cockpit with a shifter and wheel and all that stuff mounted sitting on top of this. All right, so I'm well within the limits of the manufacturer recommended weight limits, but I, you, we're not going to have 500 pounds on each point here. We're actually going to have, if it works right and you do everything equal, then it should balance out to where we're only at like 100 and, what's that, 125 or so pounds on each foot. 
So 225 pounds on each side of this bar, which is not much for this bar. It'll, it'll handle it. And the bar is only going to be 800 millimeters. I've already measured that out. So I have no problem with thinking that it's going to be okay. And it'll be able to handle the load quite well. And remember, this is just floating on that motion bar that's on the next level motion platform or next level traction plus platform that swivels around. So it's kind of just floating on the bar. I'm not sure how much sideways force is going to be on this, but I'm pretty certain that bolted to this quarter inch or 6.6 .6 millimeter plate with six M8 bolts secured tightly it shouldn't be a problem. I would, I would, if something happens and it's a problem, I would be quite surprised to be honest. I mean, I could put four on each side, but I think that would be just a bit of overkill. Right. Now we're capturing feet here, but let's say we weren't and we just want to put a profile rig onto our Traction Plus system. Well, very simple. It's actually easier than what I'm doing here. In fact, you could just use a piece of profile this long because it kind of matches the plate here, right? So you could just actually bolt this together and you'd be done. Then all you got to do is have this sitting on your Traction Plus uh, motion bars and of course have the 1160 millimeter spacing between those bars on the centers and then just come in with your rig. Let's say this is your rig and this is the sideways or width spanning piece of profile, right? So you got your side bars coming this way that run the length of the cockpit. This is what separates it or spreads it out to whatever width your cockpit is spread out to. And in this case, it's a P1 and the P1 and P1X are both 500 millimeters on those spacings. Of course, total width is going to be 580 because we have those 40 series profiles on each side and you have to add that. But anyway, simple enough. You just set this on whichever side you want, this side or this side, and then come in with a corner bracket, put the corner bracket in there, and then secure it. And put as many corner brackets in here as you want to secure your rig to this bar. You're done. Very simple. In fact, if that's what was all I was going to do, it'd be a lot easier on me too. But yeah, and I just want to show you guys that because yeah, simple to mount a profile rig using this system. You don't have to worry about cups to catch actuator feet or not, any of that stuff. All right, I just want to show you that while I was going over this part. So we're all set, really. All I have to do now is go ahead and make my marks for the holes. And I'm looking down straight on these brackets here, the middle ones, this one and this one, to make sure I line everything up. And I don't have to worry about this spacing over here because I know it's going to be equal if I have my line straight looking down here. And of course, I want to make sure it's straight this way. And I'm using the corner bracket links to determine that. So that looks about right, right there. And I can also use my center line. Remember, we had a, a center line running all the way through this plate here. And I can always look down on that and see where it's centered to. And that's perfect. Except now I got to move it this way. All right. So what we're going to do is go ahead and mark the holes. And I'm not going to show you guys that because I've already showed you me marking holes and drilling holes. But you get the idea of how I'm doing this. And I'm going to go ahead and mark my holes, go over to the uh, drill press and get both of these plates drilled out so that they can accept these angle or these corner brackets rather. And yeah, when we come back, we'll see what the finished product looks like. Now we have both of our aluminum adapter plates mounted to the modules and tightened down very tightly. And yeah, this is a very, very solid mount, as you might imagine. And here's the profiles. Now, these are cut to 40 inches, or I believe it was 1,016 millimeters, right? And that's where we're going to put the cups on each end of this, as we discussed before, to catch the actuators from our D-Box system. Now, I want to mount this to the plate, now, as we discussed before, with those corner brackets, those gusseted corner brackets. But once you have this tightened, we needed to cut or drill some access holes. And that's what you see here. So we have the same pattern here that we have there, obviously, or it wouldn't fit. And we're just going to kind of set this on top. Try to get them lined up here the first time. It's like that. Now, of course, I'm not using that to hold or to secure this in any way. That will be the angle brackets that we put on here. And yeah, once this is in, you can see how it sits nice and flat. And one thing also 
you really got to pay attention to your centers on everything as you go along in this process. I made sure I was dead center on this profile once I had the length I needed so that everything lines up like it should, not only centered this way, but also centered that way because we wanted to be directly over the motion bar itself. So to get the most support, we didn't want weight hanging off the front or the back if it was possible. And this is really the only way I could figure out to do it. So we've got that set up. So I'm going to go over here and show you guys the back one. It's already done. And you can see we've got our gusseted corner brackets already installed. And there's three on each side. And that's regular T-nuts in the channels. And on the bottom, we have some nylon type safety nuts that won't come off once we tighten them down. So we've got those nice and tight. And yeah, it's a very, very sturdy setup. Of course, it's, it's very, you know, the, the rear module moves around a lot. But yeah, this thing is, once you get it up against there, that is tight. I don't have any problem or any worries that this is not going to hold the cockpit once we get it mounted on top. I think it's going to be just perfect. So there we have it. We've got this one all bolted up. Now all we have to do is get the one over here bolted up with its angle brackets. And then it's a matter of just installing our other angle brackets that's going to capture the cups that capture the feet on our D-box actuator. So we'll get to that part next. Now remember I was going to use some corner brackets or multiple corner brackets to capture the actuator feet on this mod to get a profile, well, a D-Box equipped profile anyway, cockpit firmly attached to this Traction Plus platform. But I sourced some different cups here. There's a much better solution, a much cleaner solution. This is from PT Actuator. Now this is a company in China and I've got a set of four of these. Now these are aluminum cups. Get a little closer look there. And of course the brackets that they fit on are a perfect match for a 4080 series profile. So we'll go back here and you can see the ones in the back. And of course you can see all our corner brackets down there too. Of course this is a much cleaner and possibly more secure solution than using those corner brackets. But I think I mentioned when I was talking about the corner brackets that I was looking at some other solutions and this is what I ended up with. Yeah, I'm liking this a lot more and I'm sure you guys are too if you're watching this video. So yeah, very nice solution here. Now remember, if this was not a JCL or any profile cockpit for that matter, this is a JCL V4 of course, that I would just be mounting over here underneath this profile. I would just be setting the front edge of this profile onto the profile we have mounted to our adapter bracket under there and just using a series of corner brackets to secure this profile to the one that's already mounted to our adapter plate down there. So easy enough if you're just going to statically mount a profile cockpit to what we've already got to this point, right? And we talked about that in the earlier parts of this video. So yeah, very slick solution here, I think. What do you guys think? <laughs> and there was a $135 for a set of four of these. And you'll also notice that inside of those, I have some spacer material. It's a very hard plastic, but it's long enough to get a, a very light radius bend in it. And because the feet were originally, when they fit in this cup, were just a little bit sl sliding around. <laughs> they just weren't perfectly matched to the cup, which I was expecting that. So I just put some spacing material all the way around. I'll show you this one in the back here. And yeah, each one of these just to keep it from moving around. I don't think it would make that much of a difference as far as the, you know, the, the feet moving around inside that cup, but because it would be a non, what they call a non-captive type of cup at that point, where in other words, it doesn't move and the, the foot doesn't move inside of it. And yeah, it's like I said, either way, I think it would work, but I just, I just wanted to do it this way just because. And we'll walk around to the other side. And of course, again, as we said before, this is the fantastic JCL V4 Surge cockpit that we're actually mounting here. So yeah, this is all working out well. And you can see that I can actually move this back and forth. It's not powered up. And yeah, everything's rotating like it should underneath. So I think this is going to work like a champ. So here we are in iRacing in the 6DOF system. And 
first off, the, the chances of these two systems working together the way they do, I, my expectations were, were not very high <laughs> that they would. And I have to say that they work quite well together. And it, it just, you know, it's one of those lucky things in life, I guess, because I was sure that one would be a lot slower than the other or, or something like that, or there'd just be way too much time between the shifts, especially when we're talking about a sway and yaw platform underneath a D-Box surge equipped platform. But anyway, it seems to, yeah, it seems to deliver the goods here. I don't have a lot to complain about. Now, again, it's gonna be hard for me to convey to you guys exactly what's going on here and what you feel, but when you have a six DOF system and all of these DOFs are coming in like they should in a car, or at least as close as we're probably gonna get, it just comes, it, it just makes it a better involved experience and it also makes me a better driver. I actually, now this is what the most biggest shocker to me was, I actually knocked two tenths off my time in this Ferrari 488 GT3 in Sebring. And that's the same track, same uh, conditions for the weather, all that stuff is the same and, and same setup for the car. But I actually was able to knock two tenths off. And that happened while a couple other people were over here trying it. We were just jumping in and out of it and seeing who could get the best lap. But I was really shocked at that. And I think the reason that is, is because now you're feeling what the car is doing like you never did before. And it's, it's a lot more intuitive to me anyway on what the car is doing. The weight transfer, when I get some, some yaw going on and, or I got the sway going on with the weight transfer in the car. It's just one of those things that come together and, and just with the braking stresses that you have on your body from the six point harness with the surge element and of course the usual heave pitch and roll that the D-Box systems are capable of delivering. So again, it, you bring it all together and it lets you feel for the first time really what the car is doing all around. Uh, before it's always been, well, you have this, you have that, but you're missing the other stuff. So we kind of, you know, we, we don't, we do from muscle memory, I guess is what I'm trying to say. If we go through a corner a certain way and I don't have sway or yaw and I'm going through it another way as far as corner entry and the mid corner and corner exit, if I go through one time and it's faster than the other, then I'll know that path I took and know what, how much braking I had and all that coming together, muscle memory, if you will. And I'll start taking that route through that corner and get better times that way. But I'm not actually feeling anything as far as the differences. Here, you feel it. If I take a corner sharper than I normally do, then I feel that the, the sway will actually move me over more than the other. And it'll give me that, that sense of I'm really on the edge. I'm hanging on the edge here of losing my grip in the corner. So I'm actually feeling it now though. So this is something that I wasn't expecting as far as how intuitive it was to counter those actions and be able to pick your way through the corner entry, mid corner and corner exit by feel instead of by eyesight and by what I felt in the steering wheel. And yeah, it's just one of those things that it all comes together and just delivers a, a really good experience. I've had five or six people in this and all of them agree that it's just uh, something on the next level as far as what you experience and what the car is doing. Now, they're not as all perfect here. I, don't, I know you guys don't think it is. Uh, there is some, some sway, but it's a, it's a longitudinal sway or a flex, if you will. And I'm gonna show you another shot here. And this is the side shot that I had. And under braking, you see how it's moving there back and forth under really hard bumps or, or braking or shifts. You can see the chassis is actually moving forward. So because we have the surge factor here right there, the chassis actually is shifting all its weight onto the front motion bar and that's 500 pounds. So that's going to actually twist that front mo motion bar in a torsional direction that you know, the twisting motion causes a little bit of softness or flex in that. And at the end of the day, I suppose it's best to have some, some a little bit of give there than it is being stiff and break, kind of like the, uh, you know, the, the tree limb that bends instead of stays stiff and then breaks when the wind blows it too hard. So 
that's one of the things, I guess, the analogy we can use here as we're watching this side shot of what's going on. But other than that, you can see that it's very stiff as far as the 4080 profile here. It's, it's handling all that just, just as good as it possibly can as far as I can see here in as much time as I spent looking at this stuff. I'm going to also give you another shot of the actual rear. There we go. And this is, I had four different cameras set up, so all this is the same time, real time, what we were seeing before. And this gives you, you can see how it's tilting forward there as we get a little bit of pitch under braking, but most of the braking obviously is felt in the surge element. And again, you can see when, I, when we're moving back and forth here that, yeah, there's really no flex in that, in the profile or the bracket or the cups on there. Everything is doing its job quite well here. The, and again, I'm nitpicking here with the, the softness because of the weight transfer forward and backwards when the surge is working or if we're under braking in a bumpy, um, a bumpy straight, it, it, everything just shifts under braking, as you might imagine, the weight transfer like a real car does. <laughs> so we're trying to get real and yeah, so that's really what's happening here. But as an overall experience, it really doesn't affect anything. Like I said, if, if it gave me a couple of tenths better than I've done before ever, then I'll have to say that this is a, a successful solution and a winner. And yeah, I mean, it's just one of those things that you have to be in to really see what the effects are. And like I said, uh, we're going to do a little crash here, I think, in a second. So let me see if I can get back to that. And on the dual side here. There we go. Yeah. See how it moves when I crashed? <laughs> All right. So that was a driving. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show some actually other guys driving too, and we'll see what's going on with, while they're driving it. But yeah, that was me driving it and just a little explanation there. So we'll get to the other people that got in here and talk about that next. So our first driver is going to be Brian, and he's the same weight that I am, about 150 pounds or so. So I, I was curious to see how it would actually act with him in it because it'll be about the same as with me in it. And it's one thing to watch this on video, as you guys would probably imagine. It's another thing to be there in the real world, real life, and watch what's going on. And yeah, it's, it's more the same that we saw in the first segment of the driving segment of this video. And yeah, it's just, it's just coming together so well here. It, again, it's hard to explain. Of course, Brian thought this was you know, the best thing ever because he's, not, he's never even been in a motion platform at all. And what's also uh, surprised me a little bit that he didn't have any problems with uh, getting motion sickness or anything like that. He has been sim racing, but in a static platform or a cockpit. So this is the first time in a motion and he did really well. And I think that might be a little bit of a testament to the movement that this chassis is making, the 6DOF that he's feeling coming in everywhere, that it's, it's more of a natural feeling. So it didn't get him feeling like, oh, this just doesn't feel right. And he's going to crash here. So oh, uh. <laughs> that thing has got a lot of motion. And as you saw right there, this, this platform definitely can move a lot. Yeah. So we'll get on to the next driver now. Next up is Jonathan and he's 175 pounds. I want you to watch this under the braking here for the hairpin and watch the chassis, what it does. See a little bit of bounce there back and forth under heavy braking. That's because of the weight shift loaded up that front bar in a torsional like twist and then it pushed back as it untwisted and then twisted again and because we got some bumps coming into that that actual hairpin right there under braking and you see when you did braking there you didn't see it because it's a smooth braking area there so only if there's under bumps and you're under braking it seems to me this is when this is going on now i talked to jonathan about that and we actually watched this video and he said you know i couldn't tell the difference he said with all this things going on all, all everything that my body was feeling in the car it just felt like a natural natural experience to him and again like i said before i think that's a testament to these systems able to be, being able rather to work together so well and i think it surprised everyone uh, the results of this actual uh, project here so yeah now jonathan weighs 175 pounds and it looks like this platform is having no issues with that weight so this is Nathan, he's 185 pounds. So I was curious to see what's going on with the chassis when he's in it. Now he loses control here, overcorrects. And you can see how the yaw works very quickly here. You see how fast that was? That really was not slow at all. And other yaw systems I've been in were, were a lot slower than that. Now he's just doing some spin outs and some donuts and C 
seeing how the we're seeing how the chassis reacts to that, putting a little abuse on it, if you will, that normally we obviously we wouldn't be doing. But yeah, you can see how that corrects. The yaw is working really, really great here, and this is a good example as well. I want to show you the segment with him driving it. Now, at 185 pounds, he's obviously you know 35 pounds heavier than I am. So I was curious to see how it acted with him in it. And it seemed even when we pushed it a little hard there with the, you know, doing donuts or whatever, that it responded quite well. And yeah, no real issues there. And we'll still see in this segment under hard braking uh, at that hairpin, we should see some forward movement when we get to that point. And he's going through the S's now after the straight. So yeah, once we get there, we'll, we'll take another look and, and see how it's behaving. But otherwise, you can see that how this chassis does great weight transfer. It just, you know, just all comes together, like I said before, and just gives you that great feeling of, and watch this here on the braking. See that, the same kind of shake, but it didn't look like any more shake than with Jonathan. And he's, you know, he's 10 pounds heavier than Jonathan is. So it's still doing the same thing in that section, that hairpin with the, the braking because of the bumps in that braking section. And there's the other, there would be a smoother section here when he comes up. Yeah, see how it doesn't do it here? Because it's a smooth piece of road there when you're under braking. And that's why it didn't do it there. So yeah, again, just another example of what this system is capable of. I, I like this, the Traction Plus system here from Next Level Racing. It has the speed and even with exceeding its weight capacity, we're still getting some good speed and some good you know, action all around in all six DOFs. So yeah, again, nothing really to complain about here. The system just works and it works, I think, better than I expected. And I got to admit, my expectation levels were a little low going into this because I wasn't sure how these two systems would mesh. But you can see that, yeah, <laughs> we're just having some fun with it now. And yeah, it's one of those things that you just don't know what's going to happen until you do it. And I think overall here, it can't be, you know, you can't really fault too much on it. And even with that, that torsional flex we're getting under heavy braking with bumps in the, in the road, that it's something that translates to you as not totally out of arrears, that it, it's kind of a natural thing. If you had bumps and you were braking, you would feel that, that twitching of your chassis as, you, as it skipped under braking across those bumps. Anyway. So yeah, that's it for the drivers. And I guess that's enough for the driver section. You guys get the idea of what this platform or these two platforms combine to bring us the 60 OF. Yeah, you know, the JCL V4 with the Surge and D-Box system is awesome in its own right, as you guys know, if you've watched the review on that one. And then again, here we have the excellent Next Level Racing Traction Plus platform. And yeah, just marrying them together is, is, is exceeding my expectations. And I'm, I'm pretty pleased about that. <laughs> so, yeah, we might as well just go ahead and get on to the final thoughts. Final thoughts on this 60OF project result. First, I would like to thank the guys at Next Level Racing for loaning me their excellent Traction Plus platform and letting me experiment with it. <laughs> I also want to thank JCL Racing for loaning me their awesome V4 chassis. And allowing me to cut it down to the proper dimensions to get this SimLab P1X cockpit mounted to it. You know, it's a pleasure to work with manufacturers focused on pushing the envelope and developing sim racing motion systems. To achieve the result you see in this video, I did have a lot of work to do. <laughs> now, I had to fabricate a custom bracket system to get the JCL V4 chassis mounted to the Traction Plus platform. It was an involved process to end up with the brackets you see here. And I have included segments in this video for those interested on just how I got that done. Then I needed to get the V4 chassis narrowed down from the OEM width of 780 millimeters to the P1X's width of 580 millimeters, which required a complete disassembly and reassembly of the V4 chassis. But once both of these challenges had been met, I think the resulting motion experience was well worth it. Now, it was a matter of getting two different platforms to work together. And to be truthful, I have to admit, I was a bit worried that they wouldn't work together. But as it turns out, they work together quite well and deliver a very believable 6DOF sim raising experience. Now, I had a total 
of five different drivers over to test the system, some who had their own motion setups at home. Every one of them were very impressed with the driving experience. Now, with an official weight limit of 518 pounds or 235 kilos, I was concerned about how the Next Level Racing's Traction Plus platform would handle the heavier drivers. I weigh 150 pounds or 68 kilos. With me in the seat, the total weight of the Traction Plus unit was around 500 pounds. I had drivers at 175 pounds and 185 pounds that tested the rig, and I saw no obvious degradation in the motion of the Traction Plus platform. Now, of course, this does not speak to the long-term use at these levels of weights that did exceed the manufacturer's stated weight limits. <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, I would have to call this build a good result. Now, it's not perfect, but the small imperfections mentioned in this video did not seem to matter much when you are in the cockpit and experiencing all six degrees of freedom or DOFs at racing speeds. For the first time, I and the other drivers who were, were able to come by and test this at the SRG were able to navigate a racing circuit by feel instead of only muscle memory. It's one of those things that I wish everyone who is a sim racing enthusiast could have a go at. And actually building this platform in the SRG has given me more hope that someday a true 6DOF driving experience will be more accessible to all of us. I'm Barry Rowland. Thanks again for watching the Sim Racing Garage channel. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And if you would like to help support what I do here at the SRG, visit my website at simracinggarage.com.